I'd like to welcome all of you to our Palm Sunday virtual service here at Reveille United Methodist Church. Whether you are watching this as a member of our church or a non-member, uh, we welcome you this day. I want to remind you that if you have any prayer concerns this day, uh, you can go to our webpage, reveilleumc.org, and at the top of that page, you can click on a box and submit uh, your prayer request to our church, and our prayer ministry team will lift them up uh, during the week. I invite you to join me now as we uh, enter into the worship of our living God with our opening prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day, your Son, Jesus Christ, entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed King by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. We pray, O oh God, that you would let those branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hello, children of God. I'm Tammy, and I'm so excited to be with you today to share our Palm Sunday children's message. We know from the Bible that Jesus loved all of the children and always welcomed them and their families. And on Palm Sunday, Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And when the children saw Jesus, they were so excited. They ran out and they were throwing their coats and flowers and branches into the road and waving and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now I would like for you to say a prayer with me. Dear God, Dear God, thank you, thank you for your son Jesus, for your son Jesus, who shows us, who shows us your forgiveness, your forgiveness and your love, and your love. Help us to be like Jesus. Help us to be like Jesus. To be forgiving, to be forgiving and loving, and loving to others, to others. Amen. Amen. Now I'm so excited because you may have heard I have my friend Tam Tam here and she's going to lead us in a palm processional. So everybody stand up right where you are and get a branch or a flower or a palm or use your arms. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Oh, 
Lord's name comest, the King and Blessed One. O glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. The company of angels are praising thee on high, and we with all creation in chorus make reply. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. The people of the Hebrews with psalms before thee went, our prayer and praise and anthems before thee we present. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring, to thee before thy passion they sang their hymns of praise. To thee now I exalted our melody we raise. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas Accept the prayers we bring, who in all good delightest, thou good and gracious King. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosanna. I'm reading from Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was dusk. The sun had disappeared behind the rooftops of the homes across the wide street from the west-facing house in which I was raised. The neighbors in Ednam Forest had, for the most part, lived in that subdivision since it was constructed on land which, in the early 1970s, used to be a plant nursery. Most people knew one another. Their children played together. The adults were guests at the occasional neighborhood party or cookout. 
We trick-or-treated at each other's houses. Each Halloween, there was an older man who thought it was funny to answer the door, reach into our bag of treats, grab a handful, and say, thank you, before abruptly closing the door. He would pause for a beat that seemed like an eternity before reopening the door, giving us back our candy, and then asking, who wants a Mary Jane? Everyone loves a Mary Jane. This was always the highlight of Halloween for me. On this particular night, however, as the horizon darkened and the clouds stood like silhouettes against the sky, my mother called me into the kitchen to tell me that the Mary Jane man had died. His adult son is there, she told me. You should go over and check on him. And just like that, I began one of the most significant parts of my life's vocation, visiting, gathering with the grieving, and listening. Crossing the street, I had no idea what I was going to say. I was probably 14 years old. The English professor, novelist, and Christian apologist, C.S. Lewis, did not marry until he was 58 years old, when he was wed in a civil ceremony to Joy Davidman Gresham in April of 1956. The following March, they would be wed in a religious service, but not before Joy discovered that she was suffering from terminal bone cancer, which went into remission until July 13, 1960, when she died. After her death, originally under the pseudonym N.W. Clerk, Lewis published excerpts from the diary he kept after the death of his wife in a book called A Grief Observed a book which explores his own suffering at this loss in the context of the struggles it created in his Christian faith. In chapter one, he writes, an odd byproduct of my loss is that I'm aware of being an embarrassment to everyone I meet, at work, at the club, in the street. I see people as they approach me trying to make up their minds whether they'll say something about it or not. I hate it if they do, and if they don't. Some pass it all together. R has been avoiding me for a week. I like best the well-brought-up young men, almost boys, who walk up to me as if I were a dentist, turn very red, get it over, and then edge away to the bar as quickly as they decently can. Perhaps the bereaved ought to be isolated in special settlements like lepers. In today's text, Jesus crosses the street, as it were, bouncing on the back of a donkey as he enters the holy city of Jerusalem, where he has come to die. Jesus enters to the adulation of the crowd, who we know from years of Palm Sunday sermons is only cheering because they misunderstand exactly why he has arrived. Jesus arrives not on a colt as a king awaiting his coronation would ride, but humble on a donkey, a mere beast of burden. As Bishop William H. Willimon reminds us, Jesus arrives on Palm Sunday as the royal one who comes to rule, yet as the one who conquers through obedient, self-emptying love. Palm Sunday flies in the face of our modern notions of a distant, disconnected God who seldom, if ever, gets involved in the specific ways in which we live our lives. A month or so ago, I was attending an ecumenical gathering of clergy when we were talking about prayer, and one of us was actually willing to admit how when he enters situations with his congregants, and especially when there's illness involved, he always finds himself praying in a way that, in his words, gives God a way out. What he meant was he prayed aloud in such a way that if the prayer were not answered in the way hoped for, God would somehow be protected, not made to look bad. Lord, we just pray unto you in the name of Jesus that if it be your will for this healing to take place. The rest of us knew he was describing us as well. The fact of the matter is that Generally, we are rather comfortable with a vague notion of God, a God of whom we have few expectations and who we believe has, either, has even fewer expectations of us and our lives, 
a God we find unconcerned with how we live and the choices we make. This, in many ways, is the difference between being spiritual and being religious. Spiritual people can roll with the, the idea of the existence of a deity. Religious people, on the other hand, tilt towards a deity who seeks our attention, who craves connection, who gets involved, who identifies with our pain, who holds us to account for our sin, a deity who enters into our own personal Jerusalems, even to our misguided acclaim, to intrude upon our comfort and ease with our notions of a far-off God. It is the reason that our scriptures and our creeds are intentionally so specific. Today's text speaks about our God doing a specific thing, riding a donkey on a specific day, Sunday, in a specific time in history, into a specific place, Jerusalem. It is why in the Apostles' Creed we confess that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate This is not to place blame, as blame is truly on sinful humanity. Instead, we utter the name of the one who condemned Jesus to remind ourselves that Jesus' arrest, trial, crucifixion, and death actually occurred at a specific time in human history. What today's reading does not include is the first thing Jesus does in Matthew's Gospel after entering Jerusalem. He enters the temple and overturns the tables of the money changers. And when he does, Matthew tells us that it was only the children who continued to shout, Hosanna. The adults had other ideas. It's one thing to shout, Hosanna, save us, to a God who we believe exists on a plane well above our lives. It's quite another thing when Jesus enters my neighborhood and your neighborhood, and when the tables he overturns, are ours. In the passage I quoted earlier from C.S. Lewis's A Grief Observed, Lewis concludes his paragraph on how he was treated while grieving the death of his wife by saying perhaps the bereaved ought to be isolated in special settlements like lepers. Bishop Willimon writes, I remember the mother who, in noting how few church people had made contact with her after her daughter's death, said, I don't blame them. It takes, a huge, it takes huge courage to enter somebody's pain. Better to say nothing at all than to be exposed to pain like mine. He goes on to remark, besides, sometimes hurting people unconsciously conspire to keep their would-be saviors at a distance. You can't know what I'm going through, they sometimes say. No wonder we hold back. And yet this holding back is not what Jesus does. It is not who Jesus is. Perhaps more than we would care to admit, the distance between ourselves and God is something we enjoy. A God who does not intervene in human history, who does not get involved with the entanglements that are our lives, is a safe God, a mere grantor of wishes. A God behind glass with the small red hammer hanging alongside, in all capital letters, in case of emergency, break glass. As in the closing lines of William Ernest Henley's poem, Invictus, we proudly declare, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Or as Don Draper says in Mad Men, I'm living like there's no tomorrow because there isn't. And into our insular little milk toast theocracies comes the Messiah, the Jesus who bounces atop a donkey into the city where he has come to die is not a distant, uninvolved clockmaker who has abandoned us to our own devices. The Jesus who is nailed to a cross is not some projection of our deepest unfulfilled desires. The Jesus we encounter in Scripture and especially during Holy Week, is the God who is involved, who is invested, who is connected to our lives at all costs, come what may. And this is why we Christians call it Holy Week. It shows us the kind of God we have and what that holiness looks like for Jesus. 
unconditional, obedient, self-giving love, self-giving death before rising again and making us whole. All of which brings us to now and the situation in our own personal and communal Jerusalems in which we find ourselves today. T.S. Eliot opens his poem, The Wasteland, saying April is the cruelest month. And as we begin this April of 2020, unable to even share Holy Communion with one another, these times feel especially cruel. Disease and death surround us. Economic fears refuse to abate. We even find ourselves unable to make plans for the future, for the future is so uncertain. Even leaving the house is a subversive act anymore. We feel as though we live at the threshold of Dante's Inferno, abandoning even our hope. But to our present cruelty, I offer this, the hope of the one who endured cruelty to redeem us, to save our lives, to save our souls. When the waiting seems unbearable, when the fear seems too great to bear, when what we once took for granted has fled or denied or turned against us, when we have built into our present culture a fearful distrust of even our neighbors, such that we fear touch, a handshake, a conversation less than six feet apart in the midst of fewer than ten people. We live in a time when there are no easy answers, even from our faith. And yet, we look towards the horizon and we see an itinerant rabbi, a carpenter's son, a man born under questionable circumstances into a poor family in an occupied land, riding toward us on a lowly beast of burden, entering into our pain, entering into our sadness, entering into our fear, entering even into our sin, crossing the street to meet us where we are. For the one who rides into Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday, even to the misguided adulation of the crowds, is undeterred by our pain, undaunted by our fear, unafraid of our sadness, unafraid of our sin, even when it would cost him his own life. Amidst the palms, we encounter the one who reminds us that God is here, that God is involved, that God is invested, that God is committed, committed to us, to his church, to this world, even amidst the fear and the doubt that surround us. We can hole up in our houses. We can watch the markets rise and fall. But we cannot shake this persistent Savior who enters Jerusalem in full awareness of what awaits him in self-emptying, sacrificial love, love for you and for me and for us, for the church and for the world. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When we worship together, it is our great joy and privilege to share our prayer concerns and joys with one another and with God. In this time of social distancing, we invite you to continue this practice by going to the adult page and clicking on the link called Prayers of the People. If you could submit these prayers by Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m., they can be included because we are filming our Prayers of the People each Wednesday. Let us pray. Holy God, as we come before you today, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to worship you. We thank you that although the whole world is suffering, and much appears bleak, there are signs of hope and of your eternal goodness. We thank you for the gift of community and the ability to communicate with one another remotely. We thank you for the beauty of creation and the reminders of new life that spring brings, for birds that sing, flowers that bloom, warmer days and sunshine. 
We also thank you for all the new babies being born and ask you to bless them and their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for all your churches, but especially our partner churches, Koinonia Christian Church and Love Center of Unity. Help all of us to minister to the needs of one another and this world. We pray for all who work in health care, for doctors, nurses, administrators, and the entire hospital staff, for our emergency medical teams, for farmers and those who work in grocery stores, for teachers, students, and those who care for children. In particular, we offer prayers for the children of Swansboro Elementary School, for CASA children, for the youth and children of UMFS, and for their families. Strengthen all of them and keep them safe and healthy. Help those who are helping them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our sustainer and source of all goodness, we pray for those who are unemployed and for employers who have had to make the diff difficult decision to let workers go. Guide us as a nation and a world in this time of great economic upheaval so that all people might be able to find employment and receive just compensation for their labor. We pray especially for those who are homeless, destitute, or who have no one to care for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, giver of life and health, comfort and relieve those who are sick, suffering, or in pain, and give your power of healing to those who minister to their needs, that those for whom we pray may be strengthened in their weakness and have confidence in your loving care. We lift up Carol Uzzel, Melanie, and all who are fighting cancer, those in the hospital and those who are sick at home. We also lift up those whose scheduled surgeries and medical procedures have been postponed. Ease their pain, relieve their anxiety. Guide the leaders of all the nations and all healthcare agencies. Give them your wisdom and a spirit of cooperation so that this terrible pandemic might end and future disasters may be prevented. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for those who weep or mourn this day, for parents, friends, and neighbors of those who have died. We lift up the family and friends of Chuck Bird, as well as the Oker's family, on the death of Sherry's grandmother. As they grieve, show them the depths of your great love. Give them a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. Remind them that you are with them and that life in you is life eternal. We commend to your care all who have died. Help us to trust that they share the joys of heaven with all your saints, both now and always. In this time of silence, let us offer our own petitions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty God, in this time of great uncertainty and struggle, help us to trust that you are indeed our help and our comfort. We do not know what this day will bring, but make us ready for whatever it may be. If we are called to serve, 
Help us to serve bravely. If we are called to sit and wait, help us to do so patiently. Give us the spirit of Jesus so that we might discern and heed your call. Remind us that there is nothing in all creation that can separate us from your great love in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to receive this morning's offering, I want to give thanks for your generous continued support of the ministries of your church through your tithes and offerings. And if you would like to make an offering to support Reveille United Methodist Church, you can go to our website, reveilleumc.org, and simply click on the green box that says, Give Now. God will see us through this present crisis. And when we come out on the other side, the world will need the church more than ever. And your generous giving helps to assure that we will continue to be in ministry with our community and our world. Thank you. Let us return our tithes and gifts to God. Sweet sound 
the simplest and the best. From all event they followed, mid an exultant crowd, the victor palm branch waving and chanting clear and loud. The Receive this benediction. May grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you now and evermore. Amen.